Mm. June 21st. Chronologically, the summer solstice. Chronologically, the official first day of summer. Hello. A wasted life. A wasted life. You know, growing up, one of my favorite Hollywood movies was It's a Wonderful Life, you know, with Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the angels getting his wings. and Yeah, yeah. A wonderful life. Huh? A wonderful life um, marked by worldly accomplishments and worldly things. Hmm. That's considered a wonderful life. But what about a wasted life? A wasted life. Do you realize that there are many people out there right now who are living in a wasted life? Are you one of them? Please. Please get the authorized version of the scriptures known as the King James Version. Please, follow me along at the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along, word for word, verse by verse. Check me out. Keep me accountable. Follow along. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Check me out. start just one verse to start Proverbs 21 today is the 21st Proverbs 21 verse 2 every way of a man is right in his own eyes but the Lord but the Lord pondereth the hearts but the Lord pondereth the hearts and, and very quickly, Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. <laughs> Oops, oh, that was, <laughs> that was not good. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verses 9 and 10. The Lord pondereth the hearts. And what about that heart of yours? God knows my heart. <laughs> yeah, he sure does. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Desperately wicked. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. You've heard that saying, right? So if the heart is desperately wicked. What does that mean? That the heart of man in itself will, will uh, reach at straws, will cling to any vestige there is to maintain what? That wickedness. Hmm. And that's something. Verse 10 in Jeremiah chapter 17. I the Lord searched the heart I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Yes, God is God of judgment. God is God of recompense. Whether you are saved or you are lost, you will be recompensed in one way or another. Hmm. And that's something, and that's something. Something to note and also something to Perhaps fear. Depending, huh? Go to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. We want verses 21 onto the close of the chapter. 
Isaiah chapter 43, verses 21 on to verse 28, the close of the chapter. You might have heard or asked, why, why did God create me? <laughs> why, why is anybody here? Why did God create anything? Right? Why? Why? Why did God create us? Why did God create me? Why did God let anything happen? Why? Revelation chapter 4. Verse 11, one verse. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Why are you here? Because God wants you here. You're not an oopsie. Even though with some of you, hi, um, one of your parents might have wanted to, to abort you, but there's no accident in God's timing. You're here because God wanted you here. And we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43. We've got quite a bit of scripture we're going to go through today. A little expository, blended with just um, you and I talking with one another. But we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 21 on to verse 28, for our instruction in righteousness. Instruction, teaching how to live according to his righteousness today in this dispensation. Doctrine is what makes a man, woman is included in man, mankind, woman of man, okay? Um, doctrine is what is pertinent onto that dispensation that whatever we are in, like today this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, doctrine is things that are pertaining on to your salvation, making you right with God. That is what doctrine is, okay, more or less, all right? Instruction in righteousness is learning from things in Scripture of other dispensations that may help us to live according to His righteousness today. You understand that? Okay, because I know a lot of people, even even people who have been doing this for years and years and years and years and years, except when it suits their own agenda, seem to have uh, there's like a cloud. But what's the difference between doctrine and instruction and in righteousness? We're going to be looking at this for instruction and in righteousness. Let's read Isaiah chapter 43 verses 21 unto the close of the chapter. Follow me along. Don't just sit there. What are you looking at? Don't look at me. Look in the scriptures. Listen if you can't. Don't let me skip a groove. This people have I formed, a, formed for myself. They shall shoot forth my praise. Now he was talking about a redeemed Israel. A redeemed Israel during the kingdom of heaven. Okay, a redeemed Israel. Context, okay? You can read that from verses 14 on to verse 21. Okay? But God, why are we here? Because God wanted us here. Okay? And this, in context, is talking about a redeemed Israel. Let's keep reading. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. But thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Oh, ain't that the case today? Ain't that the case today? Christianity has become pliable. Like you can mold it together as, it, as if it were silly putty. Isn't that something? Hmm. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering or wearied thee with incense. Now see, offerings, different dispensation under the law. Offerings of a physical nature like this were required. Okay? To offer, you know, to offer uh, thanks off, thank offering and stuff like that, okay? A lot of people will do that in and of themselves mechanically without the heart to go behind the offering. Why are you offering an offering? Well, because it says to. Is that the only reason? Well, it says to. Isn't that enough? Well, okay, yeah, it says so, but are you doing it out of the right heart or just because you merely have to? Or is it that you're doing it to try to manipulate God as if uh, manipulating him as a marionette or something like that? Which a lot of what Christianity teaches. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money. 
Neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Now remember, you got to remember, this is written unto who? Israel. During what dispensation? The dispensation of, of the law, under the law, which was faith and works. Offerings of this nature were a requirement. Okay, you got to remember that. All right? Like I said, we are looking at this for our instruction in righteousness today. We're, you know, offerings. What are offerings? What are offerings? Our, our Lord is sick with them. What does he require of you today? Hmm? What does he require of you today? That you be broken of your self-righteousness. That you have contrition, godly sorrow. And that you fear him. And that you call upon his name. Those are his requirements for today. To be saved. To be right with him. Okay? I, even I am, he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake. And will not remember thy sins. Again, context, he's talking about Israel. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father hath sinned. Talking about Adam. And thy teachers, Christianity, have transgressed against me. Therefore have I profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to curses, to the curse, and Israel to approaches. And right away with that, what do we do? We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with, uh, you know, how he has profaned the princes. Yeah. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, oh, verses 26 on to verse 29. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many mighty, for you see your calling, brethren, excuse me, how that not many wise men after the flesh, wise men after the flesh, not many, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised by the world hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not. Things which are not. To bring to naught things that are, things that are not. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence, things that are not. You've heard someone say, you know, you got to get out and live more. Okay. What, what do you equate as living? Go, see the world. You know, like that stupid song? Sweet dreams are made of these. Who am I to disagree? I've traveled the world and the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something, right? I beg your pardon. But, yeah. So, go live it. Everybody's looking for something, yeah. Go travel the world and the seven seas. Huh? And it's interesting. When you, when you bring this uh, topic up with some people, they, it's, it's almost as if they become defensive, isn't it? Well, I've, I've been to so... I've, been, I've seen the biggest hole in the ground, Grand Canyon. I've seen the pyramids in Egypt made by men. Not by aliens, you psychopaths. Okay? I, I've, I've seen the Nile. Yeah. I've seen Hoover Dam. I've seen the Eiffel Tower. Or they get carnal. Fleshly. Oh, I've been with one woman, with one man, or with one man all my life. But what, is that in the context of Christ? I've, I have, I've known millions of people. I know people from all over the earth. Yeah. 
But what is the bond of your fellowship? What is the bond that binds you together? Like-mindedness in Christ? Hmm. Or just flesh? What about this? I'm a Christian. And I go on missionary trips to Abu Dhabi. I give to the poor. I do all my works. All these good things. I go to church every Sunday. I read my <laughs> Bible every day. Every day. Yeah. But are you truly serving the true Lord Jesus Christ? Hmm? Uh, is that truly living? Some argue well, it, it is. You know, for example, an atheist, by the way. An atheist whose God is themselves. You know, an atheist says, I don't believe in a God. And you know what? You want to set off an atheist every single time. And it works to get their attention. It works to get their attention. They say, I don't believe in a God. You, you lie and your breath stink. I can smell it all the way over here. It's like, I don't believe in a God. Yes, you do. Yeah? It's like, yeah. The one you look in the mirror at, Jack... You know, as Satan tempted Eve, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah, you are your own God. You worship yourself. See, we expect that in atheists. People who don't want to believe on the true God, but believe in a God themselves. Them themselves. Hence, fulfilling the lust of their father, Satan. Okay? Who said, I will be like the Most High. Right? We expect that from the atheist. The measure of their life is in worldly things, where they've been, who they've known, their stuff. But what about Christians? They live it. I go to church every Sunday. I read my Bible every day. I tithe 10% of all that I give. <laughs> okay? I've been to Africa. I, hey, guess what? I even went to Israel, to Jerusalem, and I even planted a tree. At the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, but, okay, now, but, why are you doing that? Well, the Bible tells me so. Okay? But why, though? Why are you doing it? Are you doing those things out of a selfless heart for the glory of God or as what Christianity teaches you? Are you doing it with regards to the payback? Ah. Why is that? Why is that? You Christians out there, you're, you're taught in your stupid church buildings. To tithe, right? <laughs> well, the tithing is not a requirement today. Why? Because we don't have a temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost if you are truly saved, born again, converted. Old video done on tithing, you can be in the description box if I remember. Okay? See, Christianity teaches you. Not the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. But Christianity teaches you to do good works, as we are called to do today. But you do those good works with the intention of the payback. Taking that, what it says in Malachi, put meat into my storehouse and see that I won't pour you out a blessing, that there won't be room enough for you to receive it. That's why a lot of you are still deceived into tithing at the church buildings. Giving with the hope, well, well I guess I got to. And hey, says here, if I give, God's going to give me back 10,000 volts, right? <laughs> Your heart's not. You're doing those things with still you at the center. Aren't you? See, see, atheists, at least we know. At least we know. There's no cover for an atheist, is there? You're an atheist watching this? Is there? You, you can, hey, at least the atheist is like, I don't believe in your God. Well, you believe in a God yourself. 
But yet you don't believe them, okay? There's no cover. Their life is all around them. It revolves around them. But these Christians, they hide it. So well, I'm doing it for ad majorium decorium, right? For the greater glory of God, Jesuit motto. Yeah. Yeah. And just like the Catholic, just like the Jesuit, you do all these things as a meritorious act that you may be glorified. Because you, you, you talk to a Christian about this. Not one who is of the church of God, who is of the church of the living God, which we were called ourselves, the church of God. Okay? We who are saved, we never called ourselves Christians. Video in the description box on that if you have any questions. Okay? But yeah, you, you discuss this stuff with a Christian. Christian. The worldly term for those who serve a God. Yeah. All their religious stuff and all their good works are done with them at the focal point. And that's something. And I'm going to submit to you. Yeah, living a life as an atheist is a wasted life. You're going to find out at the great white throne of judgment, boy. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, huh? You're going to go for the Lord. Uh, I, yeah, I own the business. I saw the, I saw the wild, right? I had millions of friends. Yeah. What's that going to profit you at the great white throne of judgment, huh? They ain't going to profit you nothing. Or the Christian. Going to stand before the great white throne of judgment. I piped to you. I did all these great things. I I went to Abu Dhabi. I planted a tree in Israel. <laughs> yeah, and the Jews over there, I'm sure, at that time when you know the plant a tree thing uh, on the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah, <laughs> it's like oh yeah, oh bravo, you dumb little goyim. Yeah, bravo. Oh, you're so sweet. And most Hebrew people that I've spoke with, they find that grotesque. It's like, you plastic, facade-ridden individual. Yeah. See, Christian, who are serving themselves under the guise of what has become Christianity, serving the little g-god of this world whom they actually serve. That, dear friend, that is the greatest waste of life of all. Thinking you're saved and you're not. Think you're serving the true living God of the authorized version of the scriptures and you're not that different. That. <laughs> that is the greater of the two evils. Go to Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. We want verses 1 on to verse 10. Again, this is for our instruction in righteousness. This is after the Lord had warned the children of Israel. After he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and whoop the snot out of them. And then the people go to Jeremiah. Those of you of the Church of the Living God, you know this, 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 uh, this story about this, so bear with me. Um, a lot of people are brand new here. So, but the survivors of those who survived King Nebuchadnezzar, and you can read about this in Jeremiah 42 and 43, they go to Jeremiah the prophet, the survivors, and they say, go pray to the Lord for us. And whatever it is, whether it be good or whether it be evil, what they're saying, whether we like it or we don't like it, whatever God says, we're going to do. Jeremiah goes to the Lord, and the Lord tells them, they're not going to do what I tell them. Tell them not to go into Egypt. But they dissembled in their hearts. Dissembled. They, they went to, to Jeremiah with false pretense, hoping that God will bless what they want. Now tell them what he wants, and expect them to do it. And then Jeremiah, in chapter 43, you know, tells them, you know, well, in Jeremiah chapter 42, excuse me, he says, the Lord says through Jeremiah, hey, you came to me? Okay, don't go to Egypt. Don't go back to what you came from. 
Okay? Don't go back to what you came from. Christianity. We got to be like the world to win the world. How's that going for you, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's going great for some of you, isn't it? You have your best life now. And how tragic. But Jeremiah says that to the people. And the proud people say, Lord didn't say to you not to go into Egypt, but Baruch, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us. So they disobey, and they go down to Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 1 on verse 10. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwelt in the land of Egypt, which dwelt at Migdol, and at Tafanes, and at Noph, and in the country of Pethros, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Ye have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein. When things start going crazy out there. Hey, haywire. Our economy collapses. You lose everything. Okay? You see the devastation, the justice, the recompense of our Lord unto a wicked nation such as America. Okay? Why is this? Verse 3. Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger. America. America. Abortion. Same sex, same sex marriage. Calling evil good a good evil. Pornography. Pedophilia. Yeah. Jesuit schools. Jesuit medicine. Yeah. Yeah, because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods. Whether it's the one you're looking at in the mirror, or the little g-god of this world, Satan, either or, you're serving Satan. Yeah. Whom they knew not, neither they, ye, nor your fathers. Howbeit I sent unto you all my servants the prophets rising early and sending them saying oh do not this abominable thing that I hate but they hearken not nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense unto other gods wherefore my fury and mine anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore now, thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls, to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling out of Judah, and to, to leave you none to remain? These people who are wasting their life as atheists or as Christians serving the devil thinking that they're actually serving the true God. You're bringing upon yourself your own destruction. In that ye provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt. Whither ye be, whither ye be gone to dwell, that ye might cut yourselves off, and that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Have ye forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, and the wickedness of the kings of Judah, and the wickedness of their wives, and your own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem? They are not humbled, even unto this day. Neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes, that I set before you and before your fathers. And it's any, any wonder why what's going to be coming upon America is coming? Hmm. Go to Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Psalm 52, okay. Gonna need a <laughs> get probably 
going to need a ribbon marker for this. I'm going to need a ribbon marker for a few places today. Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Pick apart, brother, people. Okay. Psalm 52. Verse 1. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. The goodness of God endureth continually. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We want verses 1 on to verse 4. The goodness of God endureth continually. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 4. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Whosoever thou art, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that for thou that judgest doest the same things. See, a lot of people, especially with that Mark the Messenger of Satan video, a lot of people are saying, don't judge, judge not. Um, I'm not judging hypocritically, Mr. Mark the Mess. Okay? This is talking about hypocritical judgment. Okay? Okay? If I were an alcoholic and I went to you preaching, don't drink alcohol, that's the type of judgment that is condemned. We as the church of God, the church of the living God, we are to judge. We are to judge righteously according to scripture. Okay? But let's continue. See, lost people, Christians, they don't judge anything, the Christians. Yeah. But what they do judge are those who are of the church of God, who call them out for their sin. Oh, then they then they then they really start to judge it, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, the pot calling the kettle black, basically, okay, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance, and long suffering doesn't say patience. Patience and long suffering, forbearing, those are two totally different things. Okay? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to believe. <laughs> no, to repentance. To repentance. Thou believest there is one God, huh? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Repentance. Repentance of yourself. You shall be as God, doing good and evil, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief? Almighty man, the goodness of God endureth continually. Mischief. A life lived without God, but yet you've seen, you've traveled the world in the seven seas. You have all these friends. Or you're a Christian. You don't judge every, anything. God's not mad at you. Oh, just believe. Believe and receive. Oh, you, you got to keep the Ten Commandments today in order to stay saved or be saved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O oh, mighty man? Boasting yourself in your mischief. It is truly words to no profit to tell you that today you have to keep the Ten Commandments in order to be saved or stay saved or be right with God. Okay? Those are words to no profit. Okay? Not pertinent for this dispens dispensation. Or, just believe and receive. Repentance! Oh! That's going from unbelief to, be uh, unbelief, to belief. <laughs> Prayer is a work. Calling on the name of the Lord. That's a work. Yeah. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Oh, here's another, here's another one. God knows my heart. 
I called upon the name of the Lord. Okay, but you're not a new creature. <laughs> See, doing the external without a rebirth, without a new man, without a new creature, brought about by see you got to be broken in order that you can be fixed and made new okay Christians they boast themselves in mischief God loves everybody just believe and receive or just call upon the name of the Lord apart from brokenness contrition and fear because they conveniently like to jump over the we don't want to offend people we don't want to scare people it's the love of God, which is Christ and Him crucified. But no, it's the love of God that doesn't judge, that's not angry. He's up there in heaven. <laughs> Mischief. We see, atheists, atheists, I expect that from you. Hey, hey, at least the atheists are up front. I've talked with atheists before, they've contacted me. Okay? Yeah. It's like, hey, you know, Brad, I, I'm not buying what you, you know, buying what you're saying. I respect what you're saying, because it's like you actually do believe what you're speaking. But yeah, 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 I do. But see, the atheist, you know, the god that they serve is Satan. They they serve themselves. Okay, they're selfish. They're self-centered. We know that. Okay, we know that. Doesn't make it okay. That's still a wasted life, and you're going to find that out at the great white throne of judgment. But see, the Christian, the Christian who is serving God only for themselves, ad majorium to gloria, the great glory of God, that you may sit as king. You might be saying, well, what's wrong with that? The, the rewards that we get are just added. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, spiritual. And then all these things shall be added to you. you got to seek first the Lord through a pure heart, not out of a heart of covetousness. Verse 2. Thy tongue deviseth, deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor. Oh. Mighty man, boasting yourself in your mischief. Hmm? Uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. 1 on to verse 4. Psalm 12. Verses 1 on to verse 4. Help, Lord, for the godly man sees it. Oh, yeah, sure does. Sure have, hasn't it? We who are saved of the church of God, which is the church of the living God, Pillar and ground of the truth. We're, we're that big. We're, we're that big. Christianity. Oh boy. Yeah. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity. Everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips. And with a double heart. Do they speak a double heart? Want to play both sides? Want your cake and eat it too? Okay, you're gonna like the tie-in here a little later, but let's keep reading. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, "With our tongue we will prevail." Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Our lips are our own. I'm saved because I just believe. I'm saved because I say I'm saved. Yeah. Yeah. Flattering lips. God loves you. God's not judging you. God's not mad at you. <laughs> Flattering lips. Oh, you're a Hamite? Oh, you're you're a true you're a true Hebrew Israelite. <laughs> Saw a video of this. Uh, Paltroon the other day who was a Hamite just went through all this rhetoric about how the name of God is not this, it's not this, it's not Jesus, it's not Elohim, it's not Jehovah, but it's Yahweh, Yahweh, some kind of crazy thing. 
it's like, dude, you're, you're, you're mad. You're mad, okay? You're mad. But who have said with our tongue, we will prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? You're saved because you, you say you are, not because you actually are, huh? Interesting, isn't that? Yeah. And they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Yeah, God loves you. Here, come to church with us because we see good things for you. All the while with that double heart, I'm doing this because it says, because they don't rightly divide the word of truth, that if I do good things, God is going to uh, bless me 60-fold. Press down in good measure, right? Still having yourself as the center. Still having yourself at the center. And while we do struggle with self, yes, we do. Someone who is truly saved, born again, converted. That self. Even though we like Humpty Dumpty, like to put it back together again, the Lord comes along and <laughs> crushes it. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put back Humpty Dumpty together again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a double heart, double heart. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Why? Because it's always tilted into the favor of I, 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 me, 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 me. Verse 3 in Psalm 52. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Shilah. Isaiah chapter 58. What was that? Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. We want verses 1 on to verse 5. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 on to verse 5. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, verse 3 again. Oh, verses 3 on to verse 4. Excuse me. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Selah. Verse 4 in Psalm 52. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 and verse 5. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and shew my people their transgression, and the house of, Ju uh, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. But where's their heart? Their heart is set on their covetousness. Atheists, those who reject Christ, we know that of them. But these Christians, especially these Christians of today, Verse 3. Ooh, verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Oh, yeah. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Why? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. I know of a man, millionaire, I'm a millionaire, and he's the first one to tell you that. No pride there, but they give charitably so that they can write it off on their taxes. You know, get it back. <laughs> Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You know, for our instruction in righteousness, our Lord, uh, uh, before the death, burial, and resurrection in the Gospels, says, you know, to give unto people expecting nothing in return. Now, granted, that's said in context of the kingdom of heaven, okay? Different to uh, topic. But 
that is something that crosses dispensational lines in the fact that we are to be selfless. Selfless. Not selfish. Okay? Less of self. He must increase and I must decrease. But no Christianity. Even though oh we go we go give sandwiches to homeless people. But would you sit there and weep with them and let them snot all over you, huh? How about you take a homeless person into your house and feed them? Well, you can't trust and then, hey, 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 hey. That's that's a legitimate thing. You can't trust people nowadays, unfortunately. No. But um, still. So yeah. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate. And to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make it to make your voice heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? Bow down his head. And to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now these are all works, different dispensation. But our instruction in righteousness is to lose the bands of wickedness. Lose the bands of wickedness. What is What are the bands of wickedness in your life, dear friend, dear Christian? By the way, I'm not a Christian. I'm of the Church of God. That will be in the description box for you. I'll remember that one for sure. Okay? What are the bands of wickedness for you? That television, right? Hollywood movies, right? Hollywood TV shows? Contemporary Christian music? Huh? You gotta, you gotta be, you gotta dress très chic. Fashionable, you know, for the in crowd. Right? Yeah. You gotta have that fancy car. Yeah. You gotta read a Bible. Not the scriptures. Yeah. <laughs> Consider, what are the bands of wickedness in your life? Hmm. To undo the heavy burdens. Oh, it's a burden to live a wasted life with your goal and aim of fleshly, worldly things. Oh, what a burden that must be. And to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. And what does Christ say? Come to, you, to me, all ye who are burden, heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. What's the next part? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly at heart. Okay, That's Matthew chapter, what is it, 11, verses 28 on to verse 30. I'm sure someone will put it in the description box. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. We, being ambassadors of Christ, having the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. Are we not fed by the scriptures? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. I know I said unto uh, verse five, right? But we had to, we had to read, we had to read that in context. Yeah. Yes, yes. Verses three and four in Psalm uh, fifty-two. Thou lovest evil more than good. And lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. God loves you. God's not mad at you. Just believe. Yeah. You got to keep the law today. The law of Moses to be right with God. Okay? Uh, you're a true Hebrew if you're of Ham. <laughs> oh, you're a true Hebrew if you uh, live in English. If you live in England. Or you're British. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Yeah. And of course, Isaiah chapter 5, backtracking. Isaiah chapter 5. 
Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 on to verse 23. Mm. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Modern Christianity. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Oh, it might taste sweet to you now, but the end thereof is your mouth is going to be filled with gravel. Bust your teeth up. Hey, Christian. How are you, how's it going to be for you standing at the great white throne of judgment, trying to tell the Lord of all the boastful things that you did in your life for him, but yet he's going to say to you, I never knew you. And you came to me, not because you saw the miracle of the loaves, not because uh, you saw the miracles, but because you, uh, you were fed of the loaves. That's in John chapter 6. Kind of Brad eyes that, beg your pardon, but that's, that's the thing. That's the thing. You don't come to the Lord for who he really is, for what he's done for you. You come to him just because of the loaves of what he can give you, not for who he actually is. And see, that is a picture of someone who is not broken. Because you come to him as if he's a little genie in a bottle. But not for the, the one who saw you in a dejected state, covered in blood. And he covered you with his mantle, with his garment. Because he had pity on you. No. It's all about number one, isn't it? What a wasted life, man. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward. Yeah. And take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. Wise in your own eyes? And prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Woe unto you. You're calling evil good and good evil. Well, you might say, well, well God gives us all things to enjoy. So why can't I go out and watch the stupid bowl? Why, why can't I go out and buy the newest car? Why can't I go out and get fine clothing? Because God gives us all things to enjoy, right? Okay. What about that? Huh? What about that? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yeah. Yeah, God gives us all things to enjoy. So, okay. Okay. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. On to verse 21. Close of the chapter. Charge them that are rich in this world. Okay, rich in this world, huh? That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, it's like, well, see, 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 I, I keep reading, hot shot. That they do good. What is good? What is good? There's none good but one. That is who? That is God. Okay, and how do you find out to do that which is good? Uh, the authorized version of the scriptures, not a Bible. Okay, there's a difference. There's a big difference. Okay, that they do good. That they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, willing to communicate. Communicate what? Oh, rub in some poor man's face about how the God of this world has blessed you with millions of dollars? No. No. Willing to communicate how God had mercy upon a sinner who was chief such as you, such as me. Hmm? Good works. Good works. Preaching the gospel. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come 
that they may lay hold on eternal life. A good foundation. And there is only one foundation. That's Jesus Christ. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. Words to no profit. you got to keep the law today to be saved. God loves you. God loves everybody. Everybody's going to be saved. And oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. We are told in the scriptures, Romans chapter 12, Okay, Romans chapter 12, I beseech, oh, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he giveth us all richly, all things to enjoy, huh? So hey, it's okay to watch TV, to watch sports, to do this, that, and the other thing that the world does, right? But yet we're not supposed to be transformed. Uh, uh, we're not supposed to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And see, it's within this stupid little argument where people will find justification to do things God hates. And all say, well, we have liberty to do so. Yeah, genius, you have liberty to do so. Because God is not holding a gun at your head. Neither is Satan. But you always have to remember this. You always have to remember this. While you seek to justify yourselves with you being the center point, not Christ. You are the center point, not Christ. You have to remember this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 on to verse 13. All things are lawful unto me, yeah, but all things are not expedient. You have the liberty to go out there and be just like that, yeah, because God's not forcing you. Yeah, you idiot. Yeah, you got that liberty. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, has God said? Yeah, you do. And all the while, you're shaming the Lord Jesus Christ, boy. Up the dosage there, man. <laughs> yeah. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh but let's read verse 13. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So see, and then, and then these Judaizers, well, you're not supposed to eat pork. What is it with you and pork? Bacon is good. What is it with you? See, trying to keep you kosher under the law. You don't have to do that today. It's not a requirement for salvation. Okay? Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Fornication. Relations outside of marriage. Fornication is not always just the physical fornication. It's spiritual fornication as well. Yeah. Now the body is not for fornication. Now it's talking about the physical. Yes? But for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Okay? Yes, talking about the physical there. But if you, if someone wanting to justify their sin will say, well, fornication is only a type of fornication that involves physical. Hey, has God said? Yeah. All things are lawful for you, but not all things are expedient. Oh, 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 and, and, and let's not forget in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 21 under verse 24. All things are lawful for you. 
You can go ahead and worship the God of Catholicism for one day and uh, fight for men's God-given rights to do so. Yeah. Yeah. You have the liberty to do that there, genius. But shame on you. Woe be to you. Why? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things that if I not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Not his own. He must increase, but I must decrease. You Christians out there, majority of you, I'd say about 98% of you, you're serving God only for what you can get out of it. Not because you came to him broken of yourself. And love him for what he did for you, knowing that there's nothing that you can get that you deserve. You're serving him for all the wrong reasons. You have a double heart. You want it. You want your cake and eat it too. You want to sit at the Lord's table and also have a little caviar at the devil's table too. Like uh, my best friend said, you go to the devil for comfort, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? And this thing about God's will if you know in first John chapter 5 in first John chapter 5 verses 13 on to verse 15 okay first John chapter 5 verses uh, 13 on to verse 15 these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know no we know something that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. And see, people will twist this and say, well, God wants me to have the best of everything. Well, how do you exp explain Paul? Who, uh, who was naked and hungry and buffeted, huh? Who was made of the offscoring of the earth. What about the Lord himself? The Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. See, God doesn't want you to be like that. He wants you to be other. Oh, he'll give you things out of the, out of the world? Yes, yes. But see, if you seek those things, claim it, well, that's God's will. No, it isn't. God doesn't want you to be conformed to this world. And Christianity teaches conformity. To what? To the scriptures? No. To a building? To this world. And where during the time of Jacob's trouble are people going to worship that man of sin, the son of perdition, in church buildings? I hate to uh, puff up that uh, his holiness, but he got that one right. He got that one right. Yeah. God's will for you is not to be like that. What a wasted life. What a wasted life you live, dear Christian. Thinking that you serve the true God. Only to find out that you don't. What a wasted life. Psalm 52 verses 5 and 6. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Shalah. 
The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him? Oh boy. That sounds kind of brutal, doesn't it? Uh, Luke chapter 12, okay? Look, look at these verses again. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Shalah! The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Verses 13. On to verse 21. Luke chapter 12. Verses 13 on to verse 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Why did he say that? Even though that's exactly what he is. Because this person came to Jesus with only the intent of physical things, of worldly gain. Well, how does our Lord respond? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Go out and live it. I've seen the world. I've traveled the seven seas. I've, I have millions of friends. Look at my lifestyle. Look at what I have possessed. Christianity. Christianity. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at how I'm dressed. I, 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 I've dressed in the finest things because God wants me to be like that. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I go over. I went to Jerusalem and planted a tree. Yeah. I did all this stuff. I give 10% of all I make. And then some. I even, you know, by taking a selfie, giving a homeless person a sandwich. It's the same thing. Done with you at the center. Covetous. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Oh, I, I, I am so blessed. Let me tell you how blessed I am. And what do they do? The Christians, they boast about their stuff. They're not, they're not glorying in their infirmities about how they can't pay the bills this month unless the Lord had mercy. Yeah, they, they twist it, they flip it. They center on the blessing rather than the blessor. I've said this to you before. Church of the Living God, you, we've talked about this before. But you got to remember, the attention span of the common viewer is that of a gnat. And having over 500 videos, that's pretty daunting. Yeah, so let's continue. Verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul. So, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah. Yeah, all oh, the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. Ah. But look at all this stuff I got. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I won't share it with anybody. That's your fault. I won't have mercy. Oh, I'll say, go, peace, be filled. Sure. But I won't have mercy because, if I, you know, if I give one to you, uh, then i got to give one to everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah, look at me. Yeah, I got all this stuff. You're carnal, man. You're carnal. It's all about the stuff with you, isn't it? Yeah, and what does our Lord say in this little parable? But God said unto him, 
thou fool, who says in his heart there is no God. But there is a God. Yes, there is. But the God that you are serving isn't the God of the scriptures, even though you claim it is. It's the one that you look in the mirror at. Yeah. God said unto him, the fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. <laughs> Boy. Yeah, man. And you look at these Christians. Uh, the black Hebrew Israelites are a really good example of this pride, of this self-boasting. Okay? And they're not... And look... You could, you're a Hamite and you're of the church of the living God. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You're a Hamite. You cannot be a Hebrew. You're not a Hebrew. Okay? Get over yourself. You're deceiving yourself. But hey, it's like, hey, look at me. I'm, a, I'm an actual Hebrew. You're boasting yourself. You're boasting yourself and trying to claim things that are not yours to claim. My riches, that I'm a Hebrew and you're not. Got to be careful. You got to be very careful. Psalm, uh, Psalm 52. Let's read verses 6 on to verse 7. Oh, no, we already read verse 6. Verse 7. Lo, this is the man that made not God his trust, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? What does it say there? And strengthened himself in his wickedness. Okay. Psalm 49. Psalm 49. Verses 6 unto verse 11. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Again, you're going to stand before the judge, uh, the, not the judgment seat of Christ, excuse me, lost people and majority of Christianity will be standing at the great white throne of judgment. You're going to say before the Lord at the great white throne of judgment, look, look at all this stuff I did with my life. Look at, look at how I live. Hey, I did this for you. I did that for you. But he never knew you. He never knew you. Hmm. Yeah. I, you're going to stay say to the Lord at the great white throne of judgment. Look at all this stuff I did. Look at the life I lived. Look, I've, been, I've sailed to seven seas and yeah, yeah, yeah. Big deal. Big deal. Who are you? I don't know you. Well, hey, I went to Africa. You know, and I built little ziggurat huts. Oh, yeah. And I wept when I saw the deplorable things. And I told these poor people, just believe. Just believe. God's not mad at you. He never knew you. Verse 8 in Psalm 49. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. Uh, hold your place here and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Thank you, pardon, brethren. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 under verse 21. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, 
who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, not in you, not in your stuff, but in God. But in God. Back to Psalm 49. Picking up at verse 9. That he should live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise the fool and the brutish, per, brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. <laughs> all that stuff that you have acquired for your life right now and all those things, you're not going to be able to take it with you. And it, all your stuff isn't going to mean anything at the day of judgment for you. For those of us who are of the church of the living God, saved, born again, converted, it will be for our rewards, but not for our salvation. Not for our salvation, because we're already saved. The works that we do today of the church of the living God are for rewards. But see, we do these things because he first loved us. Not because we just have our minds on the reward, but on him! Christianity? Uh, verses 16 on to verse 19 in Psalm 49. You got to remember this, brethren. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich. When the glory of his house increaseth. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. Oh, Oh, how many Christians do that today? And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. There's so and so. Look at what he look at what he's done. Look at what he's become. Look at how great he is. Look at how great he is. He ain't got no problems like you and I. Look at him. Look at him. Prepare yourself among yourselves. You know. Yeah. Though whiles he lived, he blessed his soul. And men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. They shall never see light. You, you got to remember, dear friend. You got to remember, dear friend. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 22. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Job, who lost everything. Everything. Except his wife. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job said not, nor charge God for this. Job who lost everything. In one fell swoop. One, two, three, four. Everything. <laughs> naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Came in naked. You're going out naked. Got to remember that, dear friend. And of course, First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. Again, First Timothy chapter six, <laughs> verses seven and eight. Actually, actually. Verses 6 on to verse 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You ain't taking anything with you there, friend. Nothing at all. And then Psalm 52 again, verse 8. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever. The contrast. Do you see the contrast there that we've looked at thus far in Psalm 52 about those who boast themselves of their riches? The riches of the world, the riches that their God, their Father, the little G-God of this world has given them. Like I said, with the atheists we expect this. But those Christians... What a waste of life. To try to seek God only, only for what he gives, not for who he actually is. What a waste of life. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of, the God, uh, in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 on to verse 58. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain. God will remember your works, yes, for rewards, not for your salvation. We're not working to stay saved or to be saved, no. No. The works that we do as the church of the living God are there for our rewards. But see, if you are serving God just for those rewards. You have a double heart. You have a double heart. But not rather serving Him for who He is. Not merely for what He has done for you. Because He's done everything for us. Yes. But if that's the only reason why you're serving Him, and if that's the only reason why you apparently love Him, you don't love him for all the right reasons. What a wasted life. Yes. It is a wasted life. Do you really love the Lord? What if he took everything away from you? You still love him then? I know of a dear sister who lost everything. And I, I, I spoke with uh, my best friend about this last night. She lost everything. And it's like, well, that's what God said. You know, that's God's will. It's okay. Because she had Christ. She loved God for who he was. Not merely for what he gave. And hey, Lord gave. He can take away. Do you really love him? The, these Christians, man, they go belly up. Their money that they got in their Swiss bank account. Woo hoo hoo yeah, you'll see what kind of true, you know, what kind of Christian they really are. You'll see what a Christian really is. A worldly term. A title ascribed of the world. Yeah. Verse 9 in Psalm 52. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it has done it. And I wait on thy name, for it is good for thy saints. And go back now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We want verses 12 on to verse 22. 
1 Corinthians 15, verses 12, and verse 22. He has done it. Done what? Now, if it be preached that he rose... Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? I have been shocked before when speaking unto Christians. Atheists! Atheists! They serve themselves. Their God is themselves. But these, these Christians, you would not believe how many of the Christians I have spake with before, when you get round about to it, it comes back to the resurrection of the dead. They, they believe in Christ as a symbol, as an appellation to ascribe something unto, but that actually he is a real risen Savior? You, you would not believe. I mean, you would, I don't think you would. If you actually talk to a lot of these Christians out there, how many of them actually stumble at the fact that our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, was raised from the dead? You wouldn't believe it. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, then, our, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Vain believers. Yea, and we are found false witnesses, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. The blood of Jesus cleanseth away from all sins. Yes, it does. But that verse right there, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Remember, Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If there's no resurrection, you're still in your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. And that said in the context is of a lot of these Christians who have hope in Christ, but yet don't believe he was risen from the dead. I'm telling you. You, you, you get right down to the brass tacks with some of these Christians, you'll find out that a lot of them struggle, don't even believe that Christ rose from the dead. Even though they, in their Astarte celebrations, they, Christ is risen from the dead, blah, 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 blah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they sing it. They have their little communion cups that look like little coffee creamers, yes. They, they say it, but they don't really believe it. They don't know it. And Paul is saying here, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all we are of all men most miserable. Why? Because they have a hope in Christ who is not risen from the dead. Hence, they are still in their sins because he's not raised from the dead. You understand that? You've heard the argument. Well, okay, and I've I've received this too from atheists. It's like, well, what if you're wrong? Well, number one, I'm not wrong. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Why am I not wrong? Because the scripture is right. The scripture is right. That's why I'm not wrong. Because this is right. It's not me. It's this. Okay? But the atheists, and give them this. Well, what if you're wrong? Well, I've lived, I'm living my life according 
to what this says. And if this is wrong, the testimony that will be left behind of how one chose to live his life according to the scripture will speak for itself. But see, that right there, then you go to verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. But now, but he's alive, he's risen. See? What if you're wrong, huh? Christ is risen from the dead. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Talking about, and it goes on to talk about Adam, you know, death, and life, made alive, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. God as man. But see, verse 20 right there, boy. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, if in your life you have faith on a Christ who is not risen from the dead, yeah, what a miserable life. What a miserable life. To serve what you think is Christ who isn't risen from the dead. But see, we who are truly saved, Jesus Christ, who is God our Father, is risen from the dead, and Him we serve. We serve a risen Savior, a risen Lord. Oh, so many Christians. They, they, they have an image, the Roman Catholic Jesus. They have an image of their mind, an appellation that they ascribe Jesus, who isn't, who is not the true Jesus Christ of the Scriptures. And they go to that appellation. Health, wealth, boyfriend, girlfriend, prosperity, healing. Woe. Woe to you. Because you are the center of it. Not the Christ who is risen. How can, he, how can it be if Christ is not risen from the dead? You are the ones that are making him be something. Not he himself. Because you're not serving the risen Savior. You're serving the God of this world. A created being himself. What a wasted life. Like I said, we, we, we expect that with the atheists. But with these Christians... Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45. A very special, very special um, portion of scripture for me, personally. The Lord, the Lord spoke to me through the scriptures with this chapter, Jeremiah 45. And very neat. But I always got to remember this myself personally especially when times get rough, might help you too. Jeremiah chapter 45. I hope we can finish this within three hour period. I hope so. Let's read. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel unto thee, O Baruch. Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my so sorrow. I fainted in my sight. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus shalt thou say unto him, Thus the Lord, the Lord saith thus, excuse me, Behold, that which I have built will I break down. And that which I have planted, I will pluck up, even this whole land. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. 
very early in my walk with the Lord, in my 14 years with our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Verse 5, I'll never forget it. It's when he, the Lord's like, hey, there will come a time when you might lose everything, Brad, but don't worry. Your life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places where thou goest. Seek some great things. Oh, great things. Great things. Who offers you great things? The Lord offers you to you himself. Yes, he does. But there is another who all this will I give thee. If you fall down and worship me, all will be thine. For it's in my power to give to whomever I will. Who said that? Satan. Satan said that. Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. Like I said, I'm not so much you atheists out there. I, we know you're at least up front with, this, with yourself about that. We know we who are of the church of God. We know that the God you serve is Satan, but the God that you actually believe in is the one that you're looking at in the mirror. It's all about you. The whole world revolves around you. We understand that. That's why it's easier to deal with atheists than with Christians. Christ offers you himself. Himself. Here I am. Behold me, behold me. I said unto a nation that rejected me, Behold me, behold me. But they would none of me. They would none of me. Yeah. One second. I've got to write that down before I forget it. Okay. But see, you reject what God says in the scriptures, but are willing to have someone, you know, who boots the door and climbs up another way, offer you something else. Who are these people? Proverbs chapter 7. We are going to be reading verses 6 on to verse 23. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, youths, a young man void of understanding, void of understanding. And unto man he said, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So a young man void of understanding. Void of departing from evil. Like these Christians. Passing through the street near her corner. Isn't there a church building virtually on every corner nowadays, right? It's a smorgasbord out there, isn't it? Yeah, let's read. And he went the way to her house. In the twilight. In the evening. In the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Attire of a harlot, scaldly dressed. Looks really good to the eyes. Looks so, oh, so beautiful. Doesn't, you know, doesn't sin made to look so beautiful, right? Yeah. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. At every corner? Who is this harlot? Hmm. So she caught him, looking like a harlot, playing up to the carnality, carnal, carnal, carne, flesh. Okay? So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, who, who is this harlot? Who is this harlot? Church of the Living God, brethren, you know this answer. Remember, the majority of the people who watch, brethren, are not of us. You have to remember that. So bear with me. Who is this harlot? Revelation chapter 17. Oh, verses 1 on to verse 5. It's Roman Catholicism, by the way. But... Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and verse 5. Who is this harlot? Right here. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, 
saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon, the, upon many waters. And you look at verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, having names full of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is describing Roman Catholicism. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, the colors of the Vatican, the true colors of the Vatican, okay? And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And remember, all the nations of the earth are not going to Jerusalem to meet the head rabbi. They're going to the Vatican to meet the puppet Pope so, uh, Francis. The actual Pope is Sosa. Okay? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So back in Proverbs 7, verses 11 and 12, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Spread out like tentacles all over the earth. Okay? Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. Oh, over there, there's a Catholic Lutheran church building. Over here, there's a free Methodist. Down there, there's a Methodist. Over there, there's a Christian Science, a Lotus, Blue Lotus Temple, Christ Life Church, uh, several Hispanic churches. Yeah, oh, and don't forget Roman Catholicism, open, openly Catholic churches. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now is she without, now in the street, and lieth and wait at every corner. So she caught him, and kissed him. Whatever kind of flavor of Christianity you want. Oh, I don't, I forgot, there's a, there's a Southern Baptist, I believe that is. Southern Baptist Church right over there. Southern Baptist. Yeah, Baptist. Oh, you poor Baptists. Yeah, yeah. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face, said unto him, verses 14, okay? And verse 14 on to verse 20 is specifically, I have peace offerings. Well, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed, with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt, Egypt synonymous with the world. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves, with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He had taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Ooh. Ooh. Now you look at those verses. Peace offerings. Paid my vows. Came forth diligently to seek thee. Look at, look. Look at our denomination. Look at the works that we have. Look at all this glory, this glamour and glitz that we offer you. Look at, we're covered in, uh, what is that? With fine linen of Egypt. Egypt, a type for us today and for our instruction and righteousness of the world. Fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Looks good. Smells good. Oh, yeah. Come. Come. Let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Come join our denomination. Come join our church. Come. Come. We have coffee and donuts. Every little creature comfort that you like because we, we you know, we, you, we want you to be comfortable in our little church building. Even if you're not comfortable, you will be part of an elite social club. Yeah. Yeah. 
brethren, and we have, do we wonder why the world don't like Christians? I don't like Christians either. If you're truly saved of, and born again of the church of the living God, you're not a Christian. You're of the church of God. If you want to continue to call yourself a Christian, that's on you. Okay? That's, that's between you and the Lord. May he convict you of the right thing to say, but if not, that's between you and him. Okay? okay I've made that plainly clear on many occasions. But look at all these things that uh, this harlot is offering this young man who's void of understanding. All things that look so beautiful, right? Right? Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. This is what's going on here. Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 on to verse 23. Let no man beguile you of your, of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, which we're not supposed to do, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Vainly puffed up. Our, our denomination is the biggest, the best. It looks good, smells good. Look at all those fine looking people. Oh, we so many blessings being with our church. Right. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. These church buildings, Christians, they're not holding the head. Who is the head of the body? Christ Jesus. Okay? Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, which Christianity offers you, why, as though living in the world, ye are subject to ordinances? Touch not. Taste not. Handle not. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will and worship and will worship and humility. Will worship. Worshiping your own will, worshiping yourself. And neglecting the body. And neglecting of the body. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Well, it makes it look good, doesn't it? And with the works that they do in the flesh, that's what they're offering. Fleshly things. Matthew chapter 23. Here, and here it is summed up. Matthew chapter 23. <laughs> oh, so many of you Christians out there. So many of you. Oh, well, I've done this. I've done that. I, I've lived it. I've done this. I've done this, 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 this. Matthew 23, verses 1 under verse 7. Talking about the spiritual climate before the redemption of the purchased possession. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, true hypocrites. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. I said it right, brother. And love the upper uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men Rabbi Rabbi they love the praises of men more than the praise of God and how many how many who are seeking God only for what he gives not for who he actually is We'll run into this in Matthew chapter 7. Verses 21 under verse 23. 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. Ooh. Ooh. That's scary. But unfortunately, that's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be for a lot of people. And back to Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 7, picking up at verse 21. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, knoweth not that it is for his life. A life wasted. A wasted life. Going to church. Doing religious activities with only the thought in your heart of what's going to accrue onto you for doing so. Rather than loving him because he loved you first. Your priorities are backwards. You go to the Lord just for what will come to you, not for what he has done for you, for who he is. You love the blessings, not the bless all. What a wasted life. What a wasted life. Seriously. What a wasted life. To live your whole life thinking that you are serving the true Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Only at the end to, to find out that you are only serving yourself. What a waste of life. And of course, like I said, you atheists. You atheists. But see, again, atheists, I, I, I would rather deal with an atheist than have conversation with ten Christians. Because at least the atheist is up front about it. With the Christians. Go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 verses 11 on to verse 19. This is the prodigal son. Now, we've got to remember, the parable of the prodigal son has nothing to do with us for today doctrinally. Okay? The prodigal son parable has nothing to do for us doctrinally for us today. The prodigal son parable is about the Jews, the Hebrews, okay? It has nothing to do for us doctrinally how someone is made right, saved today within this dispensation. It has nothing to do with us doctrinally for us today. Instruction in righteousness, how we are to live in His righteousness for today, now there's something there. But doctrinally, the prodigal son parable has nothing to do with us today. It's not doctrine for us today. You have to remember that. This is not about the church of the living God. It is about Israel. Okay? Again, a product of people not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? You have to remember that. We are looking at this for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? So, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 on to verse 19. Okay? And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, 
Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. So come up my inheritance now. What are you going to do with it? Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Like I said earlier at the beginning of this video, you, you got to go out there and live your life, man. Got to go live it. Go see the world. Go make, meet new people. Make new friends. That's living, huh? That's living? Some will argue, well, well, it's better than staying at home um, as a hermit or something, right? Maybe. But see, if you're going to stay at home and read the scriptures and have a relation with the Lord, that's far better than going out and being a harlot yourself in the world, being apart from God. See, Paul the Apostle, he lived, didn't he? Because why? He served the Lord, the true risen Lord, Jesus Christ, God our Father. Christ increased and he decreased. Okay? He had a thorn in the flesh like I do to keep him humble. Okay? So because he sought the Lord, because he truly served the Lord for who he was, the Lord used him. And Paul had a marvelous life. Look at King Solomon. In the latter ends of his life, who many women turned his heart away from the true God. And towards the end of his life, he built temples for all these gods. Because the women turned away his heart from following the Lord. And towards the latter end of Solomon's life, what was the last words we have of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his, his, keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. For God will bring into uh, judgment every secret work, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And what was Paul's last thing saying? I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. And henceforth there is laid up in store for me a crown of righteousness that I will receive, and not me only, all them that love his appearing. See, Solomon. And Solomon's life, you know, we could argue about Solomon. His words, uh, the words that the Lord gave him are in Scripture. But the latter end of Solomon's life was that of a wasted life. Because he wasted it trying to please his thousand wives, his thousand women that he had, and building them abominations onto their gods. Or Paul. Just him and Luke. He, had, he lived an extraordinary life. Why? Why? Because God was truly first unto him. And he was a sinner who was chief. And he knew that. And he accepted that. And he gloried in his infirmities. He knew how what it meant to be abased. And he knew what it meant to, be a, to abound. He loved the blessor over the blessings, you see. And because of the blessings, Solomon diverted away from the true living God. We have a bunch of scriptures where we make comparison. I'm not going to go through that today. Maybe in another video. Just so you know. Okay? But yeah, that comparison. That comparison. Solomon, in the end of his life, lived a wasted life. Paul, Paul, who loved Christ because Christ first loved him, lived an amazing, extraordinary life. And Paul didn't seek it for his own, but sought it for others. Christianity, today, seek, claim to seek others, but all the while, they seek it for just themselves. Whether you're a black Hebrew Israelite, you're boasting to glorify yourself, not the Lord, obviously, because you're not a Hebrew. You tongue-talking nitwits. You people who think you've seen God. Give me a break. You're boasting yourself while claiming to have, oh, you're so humble, right, Mike? No, you're boasting yourself because you've seen God. You know, 
God who is suddenly a respecter of persons, right? And, the, uh, and not many days, verse 13, after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Riotous living. Living as the world. And when he had spent all, because it's going to run out, yeah, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. No man gave unto him. And verse 17 here especially. Verse 17 here especially. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have enough bread and to spare? And I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now, let's look at verses 13 and 14 here. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, that he began to be in want. Hold your place here and go to Exodus chapter 23. Just one verse to start. Just one verse, actually. Exodus chapter 23. We want verse 2. Verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude do, to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Well, well why not? Why can't, why can't I be saved and watch the Super Bowl? Why can't I be saved and go after every new car, a new car uh, once a year and get a trophy wife? Why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, we are to be separate, not to be conformed to this world. That's what the world does. And this is the Old Testament. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to, multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Oh, 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 oh wait, 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 wait. Go to Proverbs, the very first proverb. The very first proverb, okay? Go through that, come on, come on. Okay, Proverbs chapter 1. Verses 10 on to verse 19. If I can get there, I'll get there. <laughs> My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that perfect will of God. Who are you proving that to? Yourself? No. By your witness and testimony of how you adhere your life to the scriptures. As an ambassador for Christ, having the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain is the net, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood and look privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Follow a multitude to do evil. He has the world to win the world. And you know what? How are you? Is there any distinction between a Christian and a worldly person? Between an atheist? No. If you're truly saved, I don't call you a Christian. Because that's what the world called us. I don't refer to you as that. You are of the church of God, whether you want to accept that or not. Okay? 
distinction. It's all about distinction. And those lines of distinction have been blurred by Christianity. And, and look at verse... Now, in this, again, look at verse 17 on to verse 19. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father, of my father's, have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Verse 19. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now see, verses 17 on to verse 19 is referring on to when Jewry, Israel, will come to their senses during the time of Jacob's trouble and turn on to their Lord God, our Father, Jesus Christ. That's what that is a reference on to. And we will show, prove this to you by Romans chapter 11, verses 25 on to verse 29. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. When will that happen? At the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Has he done that? He did that on the cross, but in context unto Israel? No. No. Why? Because they reject uh, their father, the Lord Jesus Christ. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, the election of the Hebraic line, they are beloved. Prove it that it's talking about the election of the Hebraic line for the father's sakes. Fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The apple of his eye. The Jew is still the apple of his eye. We looked at that specifically to show you that the story of the prodigal son has nothing to do for us today doctrinally. Just looked at it for instruction and righteousness. And for our instruction in righteousness, you need to come to yourself. You need to get away from Christianity different. Because what is Christianity, especially what is Christianity today, is not the faith once delivered onto the saints. Not at all. Not at all. Why personally, why people want to defend your God given right to you call yourself a Christian? I know that's stuck, unfortunately. I get it. But, you know, in these last days, we need to get our language as close to Scripture as we can. And wanting to adhere your speech to Scripture is not words to no profit. Okay? It's not. Okay? But see, you got to remember, what it says in Romans chapter 3, Verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now that's talking about the Levitical, uh, Levitical, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and stuff like that. You wouldn't know what sin is unless God told you what sin is. Okay? And that says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, specifically talking about the law of Moses here within Scripture. But here's another twist to this. Catholicism has made up a whole bunch of its own laws, which many people want to follow. The traditions and commandments of men. See, that's what Catholicism has done. They've made up their own laws. And these are what you've got to follow to be right with God. But then again, you got heretics out there who want to tell you that today you got to keep the law of Moses in order to be right with God. That's not true. That's not true. Okay? We talk about that in the video against Mark the Messenger. Okay? And look at verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
And in context, this is talking about the law of Moses. Okay. Today we are justified by faith. By his grace, through our faith. It's not faith alone. Okay? It's not faith alone. You have to remember also, dear friend, you have to remember, as Paul did, as Paul did, and so many people, and, and oh wow, we, we've come into contact with so many who have this false humility. But when you get around to it with them, I'm. it always comes out. They're usually better than so-and-so. Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul knew he was the chief of sinners. Paul loved Christ for who he was. Who is Christ? He is our salvation. He is our life. He is the resurrection. He is our hope. It's him. Jesus Christ. See, so many, dear brethren, dear people, out of preservation for themselves first, will then seek the Lord. Whilst trying to seek the Lord's table, but yet, like I said, taking hors d'oeuvres, caviar, from the devil's table. What a waste of life. What a waste of life. To try to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, without loving Him for who He is, it's a wasted life. Who is He? What has He done? Uh, go to Isaiah chapter 53. Every once in a while, I encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 53. Kind of keep you grounded. Okay? It's very humbling. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's talk about this one who did so much for us. But so many of you go to him for just worldly things. What a wasted life. Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up as before he, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Why is that? Why is that verse 14 in Isaiah 52? As many were astonished at thee. His visage, his face, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And it says right there, there is no beauty that we should desire him. But see, Satan, with Christianity, has made Christianity to look beautiful. Why? By taking away the sting of things, right? God's not mad at you. God loves you, no matter who you are. Come as you are. Come as you are. Just believe yeah. Yeah. When true faith that was once delivered unto the saints, unto the world is ugly. It's foolishness unto the world. But unto we who are saved. Unto we who are saved. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Go back to 1 Corinthians. One second. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18, oh, on to verse 25. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And what is the cross? Death. Death to yourself. He must increase, but you must decrease. But unto us which are saved. 
It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Onto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. Preaching of the true cross of Jesus Christ. True faith. The true faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The faith of the church of God. Church of the living God. Verse 3 in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The true faith that was once handed down, of the, the true faith, excuse me, that was once delivered unto the saints is a faith that Christianity wants nothing to do with. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened and openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. Died a death of a man. And with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what Christ did on the cross for us, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Greek is Gentile. Harmless, undefiled. There's no guile, sin found in him. But yet you love him only for what he gives you, not for who he is. Uh, right. Go to Philippians. Go to Philippians. Chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Our life as the church of God does not consist in the things that we have. But our life is hid in Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 on to verse 21. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. 
I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of, of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, not sinlessly perfect, perfect in heart, be thus minded. And if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Are you serving God with a double heart? Are you living a wasted life? Are you? Are you seeking only Jesus Christ for what he gives you, not for who he is? It's like, well, Brad, aren't we supposed to seek him for what he, he gives us? Uh, you're not broken if that's your mentality. If you're broken, yeah, of course, you seek him for what he gives. But why are you seeking him? Just for that or because that he died for you? Because of what you did to him. See, if you're not seeking him for who he himself actually is, your salvation. Yes, he gives you everything, yes. But if that's the only reason why you're seeking him, you're not seeking him truly for who he is. God. God. And only someone who fears him and who is broken truly understands that. Because what does Christianity tell you today? How are you supposed to love someone you're not you're afraid of? Give me a break, man. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. I love that word. For many walk of whom I have told you often. And now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is death. And it's also resurrection. Yes, it is. But it's death. Death to yourself. And so many of you, you don't want to give that thing up, do you? Whose end is destruction whose God is their belly, just like Esau, and whose glory is in their shame, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And Philippians 4, verses 4 and verse 9. Hmm. Brethren, those of you who are of the church of the living God, who are struggling daily to pay your bills, struggling with your health, struggling with temptation. Who is our salvation? Who is our hope? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all, unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, things of the world true? No, not always. Whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just. Things of the world just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue. And if there be any praise. Think on these things. 
And every single one of those things in verse 8 is found in our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. The God of peace shall be with you. When you stand before the Lord to give an account for your life, what are you going to say to him? Are you going to boast of your worldly accomplishments? Ain't going to mean nothing. Are you going to boast how you belong to the biggest church? How you planted a tree in Israel? How you took several selfies of you helping the homeless? Are you going to say that because of my church building, I saw Africa, saw Israel, I saw this and that, all the while only doing it all just to satisfy yourself? What God do you serve? You know, like I said at the, at the beginning of this video, with atheists, you know, they, they at least... It's like, yeah, you know, the one that they look at in the mirror, that's the God they serve. They, they're, they're serving their father, Satan. But, you know, at least an atheist is up front with that. You know, Christians, you're hiding that by saying that you serve the living God. Most of you don't. You're serving yourself. Self-serving. In whatever form it is, whether it's atheism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or whatever you want to call it, self-serving is a wasted life. And how many people hide self-serving by doing other things for other people? Expecting payback in return. Try doing something without getting a payback in return. Then you'll be on to something. But how many of you are like that? You really serving God? Or are you just serving yourself? That's the question I want, you, want to leave with you today. Because serving yourself in any, kind, in any type of form you want to disguise it as is truly a waste of life. That's going to be it for this video. We've got a lot of stuff going on this week. Please keep us in prayer. Uh, my best friend, our brother, Brother Alexander Hartley, he, is, um, he has a busy week this week as well. Uh, Thursday the 23rd, please keep our brother Alexander Hartley in prayer. Uh, along with his mother, they are going through some things right now, and they need the prayers of the saints. So please keep, uh, keep our brother Alexander in your prayers, and his, his mother. Uh, also, our brother from the Northeast, from New Jersey, him and his family, they are going through a lot of stuff right now. And they also need the prayers of the saints. Um, also, my brother from North Dakota, um, who's just not getting better physically. Um, please keep him in your prayers. And uh, my brother from Croatia, sister from England, um, brother from Ohio, and a brother from Norway. Please keep our brethren in your prayers. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. And examine ourselves. Because like I said, with the economies collapsing, with things going bunk here, that's coming. We're going to see where people's true treasure is. And if your treasure is in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ, 
And what matters, what happens here down on earth matters very little to you. But if your God is your belly and you're disguising it with the facade of Christianity, you're going to be made known. Hopefully this may help and encourage some of you. Hopefully. I hope so. Worked on this for a couple days. and um, yeah, Like I said, we, uh, I wrote down uh, comparisons between Solomon and Paul. We didn't touch on that, but it um, might be in another video. So, But anyway, that's going to be it. Going to get this uploaded. Thank you so much, dear brethren, who help us and pray for us. We love you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We will see you in the next video, whenever that will be.